My name is Ben Price. I'm with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Uh, my position with the Legal Defense Fund is Projects Director. Uh, I'm not an attorney. I get accused of, of being one in the newspapers constantly and sometimes think about demanding a retraction. That doesn't mean that I don't like lawyers. I work with lawyers. The Legal Defense Fund is a public service law firm. We offer free legal services to communities and to local community groups. And the work that I'm involved in predominantly is to work with them in drafting local laws. And lately, the local laws are about banning fracking, banning um, this technique of gas extraction in their communities. Now, we haven't always worked on gas drilling. It just happens to be the huge issue that is confronting communities throughout Pennsylvania, which is where I'm based. Um, also in New York, um, in Ohio, West Virginia, in Maryland, and as it turns out, I'm working in all of those places to one degree or another. Uh, so uh, I get around. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the title, um, I think, of my presentation, as uh, the, the program states it, is uh, that we don't have a fracking problem, we have a democracy problem. And that's a pretty good shorthand of really what my work is all about. We need to define the problem correctly before we can approach how to solve the problem. Because the Legal Defense Fund doesn't just work on gas drilling, we have familiarity with the fact that people are being deprived of fundamental rights. That's the problem. We don't advocate when, we, when I go into a community, I don't walk in and say, you need to stop gas drilling, because that's not my position. I have a strong opinion about fracking, and I have a strong opinion that it should be banned everywhere, just to tell you the truth. But it's not my job to dictate to any given community what their opinion should be and what outcome they should be driving for, and the reason for that is because I really am committed as the mission statement of the Legal Defense Fund says, just to paraphrase, in helping communities to establish the greatest degree of local control and self-government possible on issues with direct local impact. In other words, we really believe that the people directly affected by governing decisions should be the ones who make them. And when we're told that the people directly affected by governing decisions aren't allowed to make them, it's not a matter of jurisdiction. It's not a matter of state preemption. They're the kinds of words we hear. It's not Dillon's rule. It's a fundamental denial of the right of self-determination and self-government in the place where you live. That's what it is. It's a denial of consent of the governed, which when we read documents like the Declaration of Independence, that's the definition of injustice. When the people directly affected by government and governing decisions are denied the decision-making authority, either directly or through the representatives, and when their will is disregarded and consent of the governed is put aside, that's the definition of injustice and oppression. We don't like to talk about government in the United States, in our states, or at the local level and, and characterize it as unjust. But it certainly has been. In the past, we have that experience. Uh, thank Mary Jo for pointing out the historic context that when the US Constitution was adopted, it legalized ownership of one class of human being by another. It legalized it. It didn't just say whatever. It said it's perfectly legal. I've worked with communities on issues that have imposed the will of large agribusiness corporations on rural communities in Pennsylvania. Factory farms, land application of sewage sludge, things like that. Prior to the gas extraction issue, that was really one of the biggest issues that I heard from communities about in Pennsylvania. And the problem was that those industries had hired their attorneys to draft model legislation, lateraled that off to their lobbyists who took it into 
the legislature into committee, looked up the legislator that they had assisted with getting elected, asked them to introduce the legislation and got it passed. And what was the result? Preemption of local control of anything that had just been redefined in the legislature as a normal agricultural activity, like sludge application, and factory farms. And that's how it works. We have laws in Pennsylvania. They have laws in Ohio. You have laws in New York that say municipalities may not regulate the gas extraction industry. It's none of your business. The state will decide. We'll regulate that. And by the way, the regulations that we'll use, that we'll enforce, in many cases were drafted by the regulated industry's attorneys. And so when those regulations become law, who governs? Who governs you where you live? It's the corporations. Using your government as their convenient tool to get the outcomes that they want. We're being denied the fundamental right to self-govern in our communities. We don't have a fracking problem because actually, frankly, if we had the right recognized, we have the right, but if we had the recognized authority to simply decide as communities that exposing ourselves and our kids to hydrofracturing was offered too great a risk, offered a risk that we weren't willing to take as community majorities. And if the, we were recognized to have the authority to act on that judgment as self-governing people, we wouldn't have a fracking problem. And the reason we wouldn't have a fracking problem is because we wouldn't have a democracy problem. We would be able to make that determination ourselves. Ourselves. But local self-government is denied I'd just like to suggest that if you don't have the authority to make decisions on issues of direct local impact in the community where you live, you don't have self-government anywhere. Point to me on a map of New York State where you have the right to self-govern if you don't have that right where you live. Please find a place on the map and show it to me where you have that authority and that right. And if you can't find a spot, then it's a fundamental denial of the right. Because self-government, to be real, has to happen somewhere in some real place at some real time. And if it doesn't, then it's just an idea. It's a concept. It's not reality. And if you're being denied that authority, then what are you going to do about it? That's the question. And you really do have some options, and I'm not here to judge. I have my strong personal opinion about what we should do. One option is to do nothing and get fracked in this context. And if that's the decision of the community, that's their self-governing decision. But you know, we're the adults in the room, and when we decide to do nothing, we are responsible for the outcome. And if the outcome is the destruction of our communities, of our drinking water, of our environment, of our property values, of our quality of life. We're responsible for those outcomes if that's the decision we make. The second option, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, is to try to use the existing structure of law, the regulatory laws that are on the books. Try to get them to work for you. As we'll talk about in greater depth later, you can choose to do that, and I would predict the outcome would be you'll get fracked. Because the laws weren't written by the state legislature at the behest of the regulated industry to allow you to protect yourself against their profit making and their resource extraction, and they're really their resource colonization of your communities. They weren't written so that that could be a real outcome. They're written to create the illusion that you have a democratic process and that you have some potential remedy for the harms that are threatening your community. 
We'll talk more at length about that a little bit later. The third option is you might actually, as a self-governing people who recognize your rights and don't surrender them without a fight, you might pass law, because that's what self-governing people do through their governments, that assert your rights and then put in place prohibitions on activities that would violate those rights. That's precisely what the community in Clarion County, Licking Township did this past October when they adopted a community rights ordinance that we helped them draft that established a local bill of rights, including the right to water. By the way, that's actually mentioned in Article 1, Section 27 of Pennsylvania's state constitution as a fundamental right. Our courts, those judges, <laughs> Um, who you should not believe, and you shouldn't really care. And the first thing everybody asks is, hey, has your, have your ordinances been upheld in court? My answer is, I don't remember appointing the court's king. The people make the decisions about what's valid law. The courts, I mean, yeah, we have a real tradition of them stepping in and changing law, amending the Constitution, amending amendments to the Constitution. But we don't start there. We assert our rights and we say, yes, we believe in them. We're not going to surrender them by saying we can't do anything about it. As soon as you say we're not going to do anything because we know that we're not going to win, you've surrendered. You might, or others might think that that's a valid or a rational decision to make. Uh, but it is surrender and we should come to terms with it. When we say we're going to regulate the rate of destruction, rather than ban it, we're saying we admit we don't have the authority to ban it. We admit we don't actually have the authority as self-governing communities to say no to things that we, in our best judgment, determine pose too great a threat to our communities to allow. When we're told, well, we can regulate it, we can zone it, we can say over here you can do the destruction, but not over here. They're terms of surrender. They're not actually uh, self-assertion of rights. Slowing down the rate of destruction for some folks is easier because it seems legal. Because what we're told is, <laughs> you can do that, but you can't assert your rights, as Joanne mentioned. You don't start from what you can't do. You start from what is it you want to accomplish. You don't start from what's the best deal we can get. You start from what is it we demand and we're not going to surrender. And frankly, there's not an organization in the state or in the country. There's not an elected body in your community or at the state or federal level that has the authority to negotiate away even the smallest modicum of anyone else's rights. It's that simple. And that might seem harsh, because there are folks who are trying to do the best they can given what they've got, given the tools. And we are afraid to get sued. Yep, we sure are. The attorneys for our municipalities advise our local officials. Let's talk about the attorney for the local municipalities for a minute. Now, no, I, I, no, no, I'm not being, I honestly, I mean this sincerely. I think that they do their jobs as they're supposed to do them, as they have an obligation to do them. But we don't understand, when we organize in our communities, what that job is. And the question is, if they're doing a really good job, who are they doing it for? And the answer is, and this is what we have to get clear on, their job is not to represent the rights and the interests of the members and the residents of the community. That's not their job. As a matter of fact, they would not be serving their client correctly if that's what they did. Their client is the municipal corporation that hires them. And sometimes the interests of the municipal corporation, the municipality, differ from the rights and the interests of the residents of the municipality. And when that happens, the advice that your elected officials get sounds like this. 
Well, no, you can't pass a ban because the state says you can't. You can't regulate that industry at the local level. And so checking the state law books, the attorney says to the your elected folks, uh, it tells me, no, you can't do what your folks are asking you to do. And then you go to your municipal meeting and you say, well, what you hear, can you do it? And what you hear back is, geez, we sure wish we could help, but our hands are tied. We can't do it. The problem there is they're getting one particular bit of legal analysis that is all based on protecting the financial interest of the municipality. By the way, that's your tax money, just in case you didn't realize it. But they're not hearing information about how to protect the rights and the interests and to make sure that your fundamental rights to self-govern, to clean water and clean air, to not have your property values destroyed, to not have your quality of right, life ruined, to not make your community unsustainable, all of those things are not on the table unless you and your communities make the point and let the folks that you elected understand and educate them on this really fundamental point, and that is this. When you took your oath of office, you didn't swear to protect the financial interests of the municipality. You swore to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the community. At least that's the wording we have in Pennsylvania. You, your folks probably have something along those lines here. And if they only take the advice of the municipal attorney representing the interests of the municipal corporation, then your rights are orphaned. You have no representative government because your interest and your will is not being considered by the elected officials. And you are being denied the fundamental right to a Republican form of government, guaranteed, by the way, by the US Constitution. And if you're willing to settle for that and walk away and say, well, we tried, you know, we did our best. I guess what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna try and zone it as best we can. We're gonna try and regulate it as best we can because that's all we can do. It's the best deal we can get. You're leaving your rights behind. You surrender your rights. And what we're talking about in terms of adopting community rights ordinances is to assert your human and civil rights everywhere, including at the local level, and not surrender them. And if you're gonna lose them, because I just wanna be as honest as I can be about all of this, we're not guaranteeing that if you follow in the footsteps of Pittsburgh, who we consulted with the city council there, we drafted their ordinance, and it has a Bill of Rights in it. I know the newspapers report it's simply a ban on drilling. It is a community rights ordinance. It has a local Bill of Rights, and it prohibits gas drilling within the city as a protection of those rights. It's in that context that there's a prohibition on gas drilling in Pittsburgh. It's not simply a freestanding prohibition. All right? It is in that context. If you take that strategy, there's no guarantee, you know, folks in Pittsburgh, no guarantee that the industry might not sue and attempt to overturn their ordinance. What's the difference between doing it this way and trying to admit that you don't have the right to simply ban it and try to zone it or regulate it? What's the difference? In the first, case, in the case of actually asserting your rights, you do not surrender them up front. If they're going to strip them from you, you make them come and do it publicly. You make them do it out in the open where everybody can see that that's what they're doing. Because this isn't just a legal strategy, it's an organizing strategy. This is about exposing what the real nature of the problem is. And the real nature of the problem is we don't have a fracking problem, we have a democracy problem. We're being denied fundamental rights. And what are we gonna do about it? In the end, what are we going to do about it? Uh, I'm not sure about my time, but... Uh, okay. There are a few real obstacles to accomplishing what I'm talking about, and I don't minimize them, and we're not naive. 
One of the big obstacles is the regulatory fallacy, which again we'll talk about a little bit later. And that is the thought that using existing law we can actually get the outcome we need, which is protecting our health, safety, and welfare, our quality of life, our natural environment, all of the rights that we know are ours. That's something we have to overcome, and I don't say this critically of the folks who continue to try to make those laws work for them. I think their hearts are in the right place. I think their strategy isn't. What's the second big obstacle? Well, it's called preemption, or sometimes Dillon's rule. The idea that a municipality, a local government, only has the authority that the state devolves to it. That the people living within all of our municipalities can only use their local governments in the ways that the state legislature specifically tells them they're allowed to. I know there are variances on this. You have um, a home rule uh, provisions in the New York Constitution. Home rule still does not get you out completely from under the theory of Dillon's rule and preemption. The theory of statutory um, municipalities, which most Pennsylvania municipalities are, so are they in uh, Ohio, West Virginia, Maryland, is that a municipality may only engage in those activities and pass those types of laws that the, or, that the legislature specifically allows them to do. Under home rule, the theory is that a municipality may adopt any law locally so long as it doesn't conflict with the state constitution and so long as it doesn't conflict with a general law of the state. In other words, so long as the state doesn't specifically forbid you from doing it. Unfortunately, the difference between the two narrows over time, as it has in Pennsylvania. Home rule is possible in municipalities in Pennsylvania since 1972. In 1972, when that became constitutionally possible, the same year that they adopted the municipality's planning code that stripped home rule communities of the authority to make decisions on land use, in other words, sometimes we think we have something when it really has been limited quite a bit and it's not much of a tool. So preemption and the claim, for instance, that the municipal attorney will make to your elected officials that says, um, we can't pass this ban because the state says no. That's the preemption. The assumption is that the state's regulatory laws are actually higher law than your rights. And that we would question. The presumption is that you can't adopt local laws to assert and preserve your rights when the state engages in activities that strips them. That's simply an absurdity. The third big obstacle we have to overcome, and I want to come back to that. Let me finish that up for a second here. It is an absurdity that the state purports to have the authority to issue permits to large drilling corporations that empowers state chartered corporations, chartered in the name of the people of the state, that empowers those corporations to come into your municipality and engage in activities that violate your rights. It's an absurdity for the state, for attorneys, for the courts, to take the position that says, through preemption, through state laws, we can say you may not protect yourselves when we license a corporation to violate your rights. It's absolutely absurd. And it will stand so long as it's not challenged. And the community rights ordinance that we work with communities to adopt challenges that. It challenges the notion that regulation will protect us and it challenges the notion that the state has authority to preempt us from protecting and asserting our rights and then empower corporations to violate them. And the third big obstacle that we have to overcome 
is the idea of corporate supremacy. The idea that corporations can be granted by courts privileges equivalent to living human beings, protections under the Bill of Rights, the ability to use preemptive law against whole communities, and the idea that a corporation's attorneys can threaten to sue a community for violating the rights, the constitutional rights of the corporation when we dare to govern them. I know that that's long-standing law, the idea of, some people call it corporate personhood. It's actually been, well, it was long-standing law up until 1886 that corporations were absolutely subordinate to the community. And so what happened to that long-standing law? What happened to that uh, precedent? It was overturned. It was overturned without even so much as explaining why. Of course, when you're in charge, you don't have to explain why. And the courts were in charge. What are we going to do about it? Well, in the ordinances that we draft for communities, and that includes Pittsburgh's, it includes Licking Townships, it includes Mountain Lake Park in Garrett County, Maryland. About four weeks ago, they adopted an ordinance uh, modeled on Pittsburgh's. In these ordinances is a provision that says corporations that would violate the prohibitions of this ordinance will not be recognized to have the constitutional protections claimed by the courts and will not have recourse to the Commerce Clause, the Contracts Clause. Why? Because we're going to make them argue in court not only that we don't have the rights that we've enumerated in these ordinances, but that they do have the rights that the courts have given them. This is about changing the discussion. We don't want to, if there's going to be a legal challenge, we don't want to have a challenge that asks how many parts per million of toxin X are um, healthy for us to drink in our water? That's not the argument that we want to have between the expert witnesses. We don't want to have an argument about jurisdiction and whether or not the state can tell us to sit down and shut up. Of course, we'll have that argument. But we need to focus it on rights, and that's why rights are specifically, explicitly enumerated in the ordinances. To leave them out leaves us without that argument. By the way, included in the local bills of rights, including in Pittsburgh's and all the other communities that have passed and are considering passing it, is the recognition of the rights of nature. Pittsburgh was not the first city, or not well, was the first city in the United States to recognize inalienable rights of nature. Um, it's not the first community. That was Tamaqua Borough in 2006, Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. You may know that um, Ecuador adopted a constitution in 2008 uh, by popular vote that also included that language. And in case you think that Starting out from the municipal level is kind of like, wow, that's got to be labor intensive. Why would you start there? <laughs> Why would you? And we're going to talk about that a little bit later today, I understand. But if you don't think that it'll have an effect, consider that the first nation on earth to recognize rights of nature borrowed the language for their constitution from a little law banning the land application of sewage sludge in Tamaqua Borough, Pennsylvania that recognized the rights of nature. And the language from that little ordinance is in Ecuador's constitution. And it's now in Pittsburgh's ordinance. And it is in, I'd say, I think it's probably about 20, 25 communities now have done so as well. And that includes in Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Hampshire, Virginia, and Maine. And we expect. Uh, I'm going to finish up here quickly. I, probably not time for Q&A then, I guess. Well, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I will just uh, say we're going to be talking more about all of these things a little bit later on.